So welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Bart Ofman uh, and I'm an, uh, an analyst uh, at McGill University as part of the collaborations uh, Cultural Quebec and the Re Digital Research Alliance of Canada. So I'm going to talk about the way we are using EasyBuild. We've been using EasyBuild for uh, about seven years on a national level uh, and uh, our present challenges and uh, developments, a bit of a future outlook, some design decisions we have to make uh, uh, around this point in time for uh, a new iteration of our software stack and things like that. So first I'm going to explain a bit about our, our organization and then get, get a bit more uh, on topic about uh, easy build, etc. So what is the Digital Research Alliance of Canada, or what has taken over from uh, Compute Canada? And you see that name popping up uh, pretty much everywhere still, because changing names is, is hard. Um, it's basically a collaboration of different organizations across Canada, where we provide uh, supercomputing and other digital research services to researchers uh, across Canada. So in, in Canada, in every university, if you're a professor, a, a principal investigator of PI, you can apply for an account, uh, you can sponsor your students, your postdocs, uh, etc. And they will get a free account on, on the national supercomputers. Uh, and uh, you get a bit of basic compute time. And then every year we have a contest where they have to send a proposal and uh, depending on merit and how much they need, we give them allocations. Uh, so there's no payment there in full. Uh, and then some researchers have a special grant money, they can have contributed systems as well. So part of these clusters are basically owned by the researchers in sort of a condo style setup. Um, so we are organized in, in five regional consortia. Mm -hmm. So we have ASTEP in the east, um, local Quebec, where I am, Compute uh, Ontario, and then out west we have uh, West DRI. Uh, it's formally split into two organizations, BC, uh, BC British Columbia, and Prairies uh, Digital Research Infrastructure. And then we have member institutions, which are the universities, but also like research hospitals, uh, we have about 250 technical staff distributed on among all of these universities. Almost 20,000 user accounts have all the students and postdocs and PIs across Canada. Uh, and six uh, bigger, like nationally managed clusters uh, for clouds, uh, about 300,000 cores, uh, thousands of CPUs, and hundreds of petabytes of storage. So you see quite a diverse range of research disciplines. Of course, we have all the traditional disciplines, but uh, in recent years, it's gone all over the place. We have a lot of genomics, bioinformatics users now, and uh, digital humanities also growing. So how it used to be that we had pretty much every university that did some research had its own cluster, but that wasn't very efficient. There was a lot of fragmentation. So we decided to get uh, a smaller number of national systems, like five proper HPC systems, uh, which are bigger and then can be managed sometimes even by distributed system administrator teams. Um, but every researcher in Canada has access to these national systems. So these were mostly put into production in 2017 to 2019. And with the newest one, Naval, uh, actually at uh, McGill University, it was put into place in late 2021. So we now have, have some, some sites that have no, no cluster anymore, but they still need some support. Like we have like an analyst at, I think it was University of Saskatchewan, then, uh, he just works with the researchers there, so they have like local support. So what we wanted at the time is to say, no matter what cluster you log into, you can get a similar interface. So 
uh, you can have your, your submission script and it works on one cluster. And then you can pretty much trust that the same submission script, maybe a few modifications in number of cores, things like that, will work on a different cluster. You don't have to recompile your software. It, it can be easily transferred. So if one cluster is down or you get your allocation somewhere else, you can, without with very minimal effort, move it across, which didn't used to be the case. It used to be the case that you have to pretty much rewrite the whole script. And for that, we decided to use a distribution mechanism, CVMFS. There, there are other, many other people use that now, and I'll, I'll explain a bit later what that means. And uh, one innovation that we, we did on top of that is to introduce what is called the compatibility layer, something that sits in between the operating system and uh, the software modules. So basically, we abstract away the, the, the OS so you can run this. Uh, independent of whether you have CentOS 7 or 8 or Ubuntu or some other distribution installed. Uh, we do the automated installation. Of course, we're using EasyBuild, otherwise I wouldn't be here. And we have Elmods uh, as the module tool, uh, like most other people here. So the background is really like, where does this come from? This came up in some talks yesterday as well. It's like, yeah, most HPC clusters use Enterprise Linux distribution for what reasons? It's mostly vendor support, like the vendor support ID drivers uh, for Infinibet networking, and it's often only supported on a couple of Linux distributions. And so system administrators will not put the latest, greatest Fedora, for instance, on the cluster. That's, uh, that's like playing with fire. So they tend to have the older enterprise dis distribution. We saw yesterday that still a large proportion of the, of the Server users are using CentOS 7, uh, which is getting quite old at, the, at this point. Um, and you can see the versions uh, Linux kernel 3.10, GC485, uh, etc. And so CentOS 8 and 9 are quite a bit newer. But then, when, when some people are used to desktop Linux distribution, they get, oh, we have Fedora 38 and we have Linux kernel 629 and GC13. And I'm running a program on that. I'm just copying it over to the cluster, and I expect that to work. And I complain to support that that doesn't work, and say, oh, "Sorry, uh, you can't expect that to work." So, and some people just install a software, and what you do when you try to get the software to work? Well, you go to the documentation of that software, and the software will just say, "Please install the software. Please install the de dependencies to install dependencies. You do sudo apt get install, whatever you need." So they type that in on the cluster and they'll get the pseudo uh, lecture. We trust that you have received the usual lecture. Please type your password, type the password. And sometimes they get even scarier messages saying, you have been reported. And so, um, these messages are all sent to Santa, which then will not give them presents uh, for Christmas. So just so you know. <laughs> Anyway, uh, so they, they try that, but it doesn't work. And it was to tell me, yeah, but it doesn't work that way on HPC systems. We have modules. So traditionally, people wrote modules. What does that mean, a module? Most people don't know what this is, but there's some that may not be so familiar. Like, OK, you, you just write a bunch of environment variables in a file. You put that file somewhere, and uh, you load the module file using, say, module load Python 279, and you get these environment variables in your environment and you can load Python and you can Python 279. Very old now, but this is for illustration because this is how, how we used to do that back in the day. Now, how were they created? Of course, by hand. You take another module file, you copy it, you adjust what you need, and then bah, you have a new module file. Uh, if you did a little bit better, you have like a logging system. We say, oh, I did this today. I created this file. I I modified it like this, so you have like a record of what you did, so at least you have some history. But it's still very messy. And one advantage is you make yourself invaluable, so people put a high insurance value on you if you're the only person who does that on the site. Um, so this is why easy building exists, basically, just to automate these things uh, in a more consistent fashion. So what we are having is a design overview, and this is a, a layered view that you will also probably see in Casper's talk. Uh, 
uh, so uh, I'm spoiling that a little bit, but I cannot present my talk without this picture. Um, so our software setup is, is layered with a top layer, which is called the, uh, the easy build layer, which has all the modules. So we compile our software with easy build. Um, anything that's compiled with the Intel compiler or NVHPC or UCP PGI, uh, anything that uses MPI, put in a module, people can load that software using module load, whatever. Uh, under this, it's a compatibility layer, which has more of the boring dependencies. So when you use easy build uh, without any modifications, you get a whole bunch of dependencies in the beginning, which are fairly boring that people usually don't load directly, uh, like the other tools. Um, you have a module for it, but, but uh, scientific users are not particularly interested in that software. They want to load Chromex or NMD or some other software that they need for their research. These are more like the boring dependencies that we have put in the compatibility layer. Uh, and it also replaces parts of the operating system. So we can have very uh, minimal nodes, compute nodes on clusters, which have a very minimal amount of software, which then can live in a, in, inside a RAM disk just an image in memory, and all the rest of the software comes from CVMFS um, by our software stack. Then under this, it's another gray area where we have some things that could be in the compatibility layer, but it's very system-y, uh, like IB client libraries, CUDA client libraries are in the system, but IB libraries, we put them in the compatibility layer because it works fine. Uh, it can be overridden if it doesn't work well. And then at the very bottom, we have stuff that needs to be on this, uh, needs to be installed by system administrators, like the Linux kernel, of course, the daemons, the drivers, to the runtime libraries, anything privileged, like we're not touching anything that needs root, um, that is always local. And sometimes there's software that or li has licensing restrictor, uh, restrictions that we cannot put in CVMFS, not even a restricted CVMFS that is internal, uh, like FASP has these restrictions. They just say, no, we have to abide by the copyright and then uh, that's it. So what is CVMFS? So CVMFS is like a distributed file system. It means that you have the, uh, the few of the files you have is the same no matter where you log in, but it's distributed using various layers. So basically when you publish some software like we do, we first put it on what is called the stratum zero. Then the software is distributed from the stratum zero into multiple stratum ones. And then the, the individual sites, they will pull that data from the stratum ones they can have a, a main stratum one ser uh, server and if one of the stratum ones is down you can use another one uh, again cache into what's called a squid and then we have client nodes uh, which take that data from the, from the cache so the first time you use a file on cvmfs there may be a bit of a wait because it got downloaded over the network the second time you use it it's all cached and it's all super quick So what we're using for the compatibility layer is a system called Gentoo Prefix. It used to be, uh, we used to use something called Nix, uh, but we found Gentoo uh, to be a better match, a more minimal solution to what we want. And so Gentoo Prefix is just like Gentoo Linux, or Lin Linux distribution where everything's compiled from source, but it's put in a prefix. So instead of putting everything at a slash, the top directory level is put at some, uh, some lower directory. And it's, a, it's, it's just a management system uh, to use e-builds to compile software. And we use that Gen2 to compile anything that's of little scientific interest and where the performance is not crucial. Uh, and so we have that layer of lots of convenient tools, uh, including editors, libraries, build tools, uh, uh, just the common LS core users, et cetera. Um, and then we have newer versions of what is, is in, for 
for instance, Sentinel-7. And we use it as an abstraction layer between the OS and the scientific software stack. So you load the module, and then as soon as you load the module, 10 to 2020, you get uh, more or less whatever it tends to look like in 2020. Uh, yeah, the question is whether I'm using 10 to 2020 to compile stuff on easy build. Uh, yes, it is the bottom layer for easy build. So we're using that as the system layer, more or less. Uh, so for instance, with, when you install easy build as a bootstrap or you bootstrap PC core really, and, and, and without any modifications, it will try to bootstrap from the system. And for us, the system from the easy build perspective is Central prefix. Um, so for easy build, I, I put the same scheme for the logo, but it's not quite. We get rid of Nix, we replace by Gen uh, two, but here we get rid of the old logo and replace by the new logo. Um, we we use that to just automate installation of scientifically oriented software and generation module files. Then we have L mods has been covered already, so we use that for the hierarchy. Uh, sort of a hierarchy module module system so that we lose it. We load a compiler and an MPI and a CUDA module to get a particular view of the, of the module. So conceptually, what we have are builds. We call them recipes, like an easy config is a recipe, an e-build is a recipe. Um, and we store them in, 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 uh, in Git repositories. Uh, we have forked the easy build repositories, but over the years that got a little bit messy and every time there's a new easy build release, I do, uh, I, I sync it with the upstream easy build and particularly for easy block, and I got into quite uh, horrendous merge conflicts at some point. So I decided to go the way of some other sites like Yulich, which has like a custom repository, which is not a fork of the easy block system custom bunch of easy blocks so we have a more clean separation between the uh, between our easy configs and the upstream one uh, so that's sort of a work in progress to do that and gen to overlay already works like that that's gentle overlay is just an overlay over the upstream gen to where you just have the e builds that uh, gen to themselves don't provide so how do we decide what goes in easy build what goes in Gen 2, so say, is it performance critical or does it depend on the MPI? Uh, or does it use Fortran? Yes, in that case, we'll use Easy Build. Uh, are there multiple versions needed via modules? Like, for instance, uh, for something like, like CMake, the people often need uh, a newer version than provided by the base layer. We may need easy to use Easy Build. And for anything else, we will use them too. So uh, yeah. this is a little bit different from the the, the decision list for, for easy, which we covered in the next talk. So for easy, they put a lot more in the software layer with easy build, and we put uh, quite a bit more in the compatibility layer. It's just a different design choice. There's no right or wrong here. It's just a different way of doing things. Um, then, uh, the way our workflow works is that we have a specific build node. We uh, have a, a custom user, an EB user that compiles software. So we can do a test install in our home directory on the build node. Then we install it as the central user. Uh, then we can test it on that build node. We can uh, deploy it on the CVinvest test repository, the dev repository. Uh, we can test it on the cluster with pROOT to just change the path, or we can use Aptane or Singularity to just uh, change the path on the cluster to do some testing, and then we can deploy on the production repository if we know it works. Now, sometimes we shortcut this a little bit when it's a new module with nobody else's uses, then, then there's no uh, risk of breaking things when it's just a new module, but when we update a, a, a module that's already there, we have to be more careful and test it more carefully. 
So you may have noticed that we used to use Nix and we tried with Gentoo. Uh, and while we, why did we do that? So in Nix, uh, there's a somewhat complicated scheme where they can use multiple versions in parallel using hashed directory names. Uh, this mostly worked, but we had sometimes that hashed directories would leak into users' environments that would sometimes confuse users. And sometimes you would update software in place and the hash directories would be garbage collected and just disappear and user stuff would break. And the main problem that we had with that is that Nix is designed to work at the top level and we had it at uh, sandwich in between two levels. And uh, it wasn't really designed to work that way and we ran into that because of the, uh, basically, basically, uh, Using something the way it's not designed to work is asking for, for problems that way. So with gentle prefix, we don't have the, 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 the complicated symbolic links with hash directory names, and, and it's just like more of a minimal solution of what we need. So, so we changed to gentle for that reason. Uh, another important part of our software stack is the Python wheels. So basically, um, instead of having a very fat Python module uh, plus uh, custom modules for, for Python extensions, we have a, a more basic Python module, a bit more like Python Bear, um, where we just have enough infrastructure to build Python wheels and to, to install things with Python and Pip, etc. And we supply wheels that users can install in in virtual environments. So we have a, a wheelhouse, uh, which is all set automatically. People install a Python package. So what we tell them to do is to um, set up a virtual environment. They do virtual ant some environment. Uh, they enter that environment. They pip install whatever they need, and then uh, they can load their stuff. Uh, and so this way we have a very flexible setup for the users without having uh, fixed versions by our module. Uh, users can even compile their own wheels if they want to. And how that works is that we tell users uh, if they want, say, TensorFlow, they can type a fail wheel TensorFlow and it will find TensorFlow that we have in the wheelhouse. We have now a lot of, mod of wheels in the wheelhouse, more than 10,000. Actually, not right now we have more Python wheels than we have modules, amazingly. So I was quite astounded by that uh, myself, actually. Uh, so we have a wiki page about that. And people will just type avail wheels TensorFlow. And they say, oh, we can install TensorFlow 2.11 via pip. And it will get the TensorFlow that we know is optimized to our system. Uh, and it's available for free Python versions at this point, 3.8, 3.9. Those are the the ones we Python versions that we support at this point. We we dropped Python 3.7 about a year ago, and now we are uh, we've just introduced 3.11 to the mix. But most the default is now 3.10. So you see how it goes over the years that the number of modules just keeps on growing. Also because we keep the old environment. Uh, so right now we have just over 10,000 modules uh, and, uh, and even more Python wheels. So what does it look like? Now you may know that in, in easy build, we have the common tool change, POS and Intel, and there's a new release twice a year. So there's always 2020A, 2020B, et cetera. We have a more slower, uh, cadence for the for the default modules, like we have something every two to three years, where we have something where we compile, recompile everything. So we don't do that every six months. Uh, so at the moment, our production environment would be called Standard Env 2020, is mostly based on Intel and OpenMPI 403 and GC930. So now there's a lot of software that sits at the GCC core level. It means that we just it doesn't need MPI, it doesn't need 
blus or anything. It just needs uh, it just needs CTC. And so when people do module fill to see, for instance, the vast majority of bioinformatics software is just CCC core compiled, and they see that, and we already have the arch optimization flags to do to make it work fast enough. Uh, and then there's a much smaller subset of software that we compile with Intel or MPI, or both. Um, so we compile still. Compile most software with CC 930, which is getting a little bit older, but it works fine for the vast majority of things. Uh, we did a slight modification where we uh, had a new production cluster, Naval, which used AMD, where the other ones used Intel. And after some benchmarking, and the link is here, um, I found out that um, that for that for AMD it was uh, Bliss was more performant than using MKL, so we use Plexiblast to decide which backend to use for linear algebra. So on, on the AMD clusters we use Bliss, and on the Intel clusters we use MKL, but the users could see oh we're using Plexiblast. Um, we do have newer tool chains available. For instance, there's uh, uh, we have uh, 2022A tool chains. Uh, Users don't see the tool chains themselves. Uh, that's more an easy build internal things to us, but they just can do module OTC 11.3. If they do that, they get a newer open MPI, they, they get a newer uh, software stack uh, that they have. To. But it's not what they see at the default module view. Uh, it's just if people need something newer, they can just go to the module. So we made that the default in April 2021, but the older software stacks available for people who want it. Now we're working on a new environment, of course. We uh, we need to replace the standard env 2020, and now it's like until maybe the new standard env 2023. That would then have mostly software from, from this year, but it would be in production in 2024 because it takes some time to recompile everything and then make it the default. So so from beginning to end, we, we give ourselves about a year. Um, so the plan is now to use something more based on FOSS 2023A. Uh, we found out this, uh, that there's not so many benefits to compiling things with Intel. There's some things that work better with GC, some things that work better with Intel. But when we want to distribute to the public, it's uh, it's always safer to to depend on open source software and not have have licensing issues like you'd have with Intel. Um, so uh, this is all based on software that hasn't been released yet. So we're probably sticking with the TC twelve point three and Open MPI four one five. I suspect those will go in the twenty twenty three A common tool chains. They haven't been set in stone yet, but probably that way. Uh, so there are some things in the pipeline. We have to weigh pros and cons of using that. Like the CC13 is better support for newer AMD GPUs. There's an open MPI5 that's been a long time coming and it may be more performant to use. So if we are very risky, we could include those. But uh, time experience has told us to, to, that it pays off to be a little bit more careful and then leave the the, the more risky stuff to users who actually benefit from it. Um, so every time we, we had a new layer, a new iteration of the standard environment, we have to say, oh, what goes in the software layer at the top layer? What goes in the compatibility layer? Do we have to move things around? And so some of the things we've learned is that build tools are also a bit of a headache. Like what do we do with CMake, Ninja, Mason, etc.? They 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 are sort of automatically installed if you install, install Chen 2, but uh, easy build of them wants like a specific version. Sometimes the version from 2020 is too old, so you want to have a module for that as well. And so we may just say, okay, uh, instead of having a base version in the Chen 2 prefix and a module for it, we'll just kick it out of the Chen 2 prefix and have only a module for it. Um, now there's a lot of, of overlap in the compatibility layer with, with easy, what was easy is, is using, you could almost say like easy 
is developing a subset of what we're we're doing. So I'm, I'm trying to learn from Easy, much as they're, they're sort of learning from us. Uh, and so I'm, I'm picking up a lot of ideas uh, about how to do things more properly, more automated uh, in particular. Uh, another thing we that that um, caught my eye is a solution for our path um, from uh, uh, a guy named Harman Stoppels who works in Switzerland. That seems to be a Dutchman. Um, so what what we're doing instead of using LD library path on our stack is that uh, all our software has an R path and links to a particular library using the R path embedded in the binary. Uh, the problem with that is that for, in order for that to work, we have an, a linker wrapper. So instead of using the regular LD, users execute a linker, which then inserts the, the, the libraries in there. Uh, now, easy build also has functionality for our path with minus minus RP, but instead of at a linker level, it uses it at the compiler level. And it doesn't directly translate into the user. So if the user compiles their own software and loads a module, they still need the LD library path. Otherwise, at runtime, the, the software will not pick it up. So there's a, an idea from, from Harman Sopel saying, let's change the SO name like a particular uh, particular field inside the, the library and then when you link that library it will just pick up the the runtime path automatically uh, without any need for a wrapper or LD library path. Uh, so that's that's a very promising solution because it will work uh, it, it will basically work without additional hacks apart from changing the libraries themselves. So we're looking into that. Yeah, that's another thing. Yeah, uh, but what Kenneth says is speed things up. Uh, it, it eliminates some load, uh, load storms. Uh, like we're not as affected by load storms uh, as as in upstream easy build. That's because so much of our stuff is in the compatibility layer that they already find a majority of the libraries usually in the compatibility layer, and then the R path is fairly small. Only has like Two, three, four entries, and so it only looks in those two, three, four entries. But if you have the libraries embedded in the binaries, it will not search a, a list of directories for that particular file. It can directly open that file and doesn't have to spend a lot of time searching for the libraries. So that's what this is also a good solution. So I know that that Alan Kais was was uh, looking at this as well and uh, getting a pull request for easy build uh, uh, to do this. He, he is more of a spec developer, so it's been optional and now in spec for, for some time. Uh, another thing that we've, we've seen is a, a bit of a war story. Like we ran into a bug in CPMFS where we updated some, some file in place. We did a TLIPC update because somebody said, hey, this is a cool feature of TLIPC. Okay, well, let's, let's put it in. And then uh, I. I deployed it, I tested it, and then boom, we got a lot of complaints. So it was quite embarrassing. And so basically, I pushed a, a new libc library into CVMFS, and processes started crashing randomly. And I was just checking what's going on here. I did a SHA-256 sum on the, on the library, and it would give different results every time I did it. I said, what is going on here? This was very bad. So we scrambled and referred it to the older version, which you can do because CVMFS keeps a bit of a history. Um, and uh, so this became a bug in CVMFS, and eventually uh, the main developer of CVMFS uh, concluded this was a particular uh, nasty case of cache poisoning, which they have. Uh, um, fixed in a newer update of CVMFS 2.10, so people can be a bit can stop worrying about in-place updates, uh, and uh, um, because it's fixed at this point. There's still synchronization issues if you do in-place updates. Uh, like you have MPI processes, these updates should be atomic because 
otherwise you can have a process that has a newer version of a library on one compute node than on an other compute node if the CVFS update doesn't arrive at exactly the same time. So it's still something you have to be really fret carefully if you do in place updates on CVFS. Uh, another thing you, you see when you use a compatibility layer instead of uh, just using the basic RPMs on uh, a cluster is that there's software that is not used to it. And particularly you see that with proprietary software from vendors. They've done their QA, of course, on particular Linux distributions. Uh, there's different workarounds we're using. We have a a script called setrpath.sh, which basically patches all the binaries to set the R path correctly so they link to our libraries. Um, and then we have to work around some users. Some use for whatever reason, put user lib64 as LD library path and they bash RC. Of course, that doesn't work. We tell them, please don't do that. But there are also commercial packages who do these kind of tricks in wrapper scripts that launch their binaries. So then we have to patch the wrapper script of the commercial vendor. Um, and of course, there are also users who just download binaries from random places. And it happens a lot with Anaconda and to a lesser, lesser extent with Julia. So they just do a Conda install, much they do on their local computer. And they fill their home directory with a ton of binaries. Uh, and sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't, like in yesterday afternoon's talk. Uh, it, it, some people end up loading, uh, downloading a custom open MPI, which then using the Ethernet network, it just, uh, it's kind of outside of control and it becomes very hard to support. So we basically strongly discourage people to, to use uh, Anaconda. Our Python page is very much like, please don't use Conda. It's, <laughs> it's just so hard to support. Um, and so, there are cases where it's really too hard to make things work with our software layer. So, okay, well, we throw our hands in the air, we give up, use to use container. Okay, it works, it may not be optimal, but at least you get your work done, you get your paper published, everybody's happy. Another thing we, we're working, we, we have some, some compatibility layer uh, OS boundary challenges. Uh, sometimes Gen2 prefix is designed in a way uh, slightly differently than what we're doing. Uh, they even are set up in a way that they can run daemons uh, in the compatibility layer um, because it's more aimed at, uh, at local computers where people have, have root and privileges like that. So we have a slightly different use case where the daemons are all working from the OS level, and for that reason, the directory says far sh should really not be in the prefix, it should be at the base level. So there's some things that we work around with symbolic links, just sim linking from the prefix to, to slash far. Uh, you can also patch it in files. So I'm still working on trying to move on out the compatibility layer a bit like that. Uh, but other other and it works remarkably well. We have, unlike uh, EC at Can, we even have a whole mate desktop compiled in the compatibility layer so people can, can run uh, um, can run VNC, so they can run VNC server via Tiger or a Turbo VNC on a compute node and then connect to it via VNC. Even using Jupyter Hub, so you can have VNC in the, in the browser window uh, and use virtual TL uh, accelerated uh, uh, graphics even uh, in the window. So, so there's a bunch of things in working with uh, with Gen2 uh, that works remarkably well. And then we just have one made desktop where we don't have to rely on the OS. Um, we even have some SE Linux support, like the file system labels. One time a system in society, LS that you have in the compatibility layer doesn't show some information that comes from SE Linux. Um, so we have that as well. Then another peculiarity is that uh, 
we have a funny system where we basically uh, collapse CC core into a system uh, by using a stand by using a common lib standard C++ library. Uh, we're using hooks and easy build to basically change the name of of full 1.0 CC core 11.3 to just full 1.0. So basically change from CC core to system on the fly and it works, but it, it's a little bit messy and sometimes it conflicts with the dependency uh, with the way easy build re resolves dependencies. So I'm, I'm still sort of uh, trying to figure out how to best resolve this. And, and I noticed in the easy build repository, there's something called TC core minus system dot ed. That may be a better solution for us. Uh, it's been put there a few years ago. It served a bit from Bitrot, but it may give us a better way, maybe using a gentle compile TC instead of an easy build compile TCC may be best because I mean, why would, it, would why do we have two different versions of TC 930 at the moment? We have one compiled with Gen 2, another one with Easy Build. Is it really necessary to have the two of them? So, needs a bit of uh, sorting out uh, and experimenting. So, that's basically concluding my talk. Uh, one thing I should say is that the public part of our stack is available everywhere. We have documentation linked here. Uh, you can if you set up CVMFS on, on, on a Linux laptop, uh, it has to be x86 on like easy, by the way, but most people still use x86. Um, you can get uh, the whole stack. You can load the modules, which is nice. I finish the research as well because they can get the modules on their own laptop or workstation and thereby get the same environment as on the clusters and just use that testing at their own leisure. Um, and so the, 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 what we can do is, for instance, sharing a bit of work with, with easy on the compatibility layer for the future. Um, and uh, that's about it for my talk at the moment. Let's try this. You can use this as a mic for the audience here. Are there, are, are there any questions for Bart? Um, yeah, I was wondering how many systems uh, make this CVMFS stack available uh, in Canada? He's asking how many, how many deploys is CVMFS stack available? How do you mean how many trade them once or? Well, because I was looking at the website, I was curious, and I saw something like six or seven systems being listed there as being part of the alliance. But I thought you had it deployed on more systems, no? He says a six, six systems, well, uh, that um, are part of the, that mounts the CPMFS, but there are more systems that mount it. Uh, so if we go to the earlier slides, we have, we have five large national HPC clusters. They all mount this software stack. This is the primary use case. But what we've seen is that regional clusters or departmental clusters, they also mount the CVFS. And we actually have a, a voluntary spreadsheet where we ask people, oh, if you use our stack, please, please tell us that we use it. And we found out that uh, we had about 30 entries and, and uh, there's some, some like really small use to some individual laptop, but there's some some research institutions, some uh, universities, uh, most uh, about half across Canada, and then a few in France, a few uh, in other countries uh, that use it for various reasons. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Yeah. Sorry, maybe I did just didn't understand it enough, but what do you do with Python packages that are not in your real repository? That are not in our real repository. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, so, so, what happens what when happens somebody when does somebody pip install some installs. random Python package? Like if they do they pip install pip NumPy, install. they will get the NumPy from our wheelhouse because we have mm -hmm. it there or TensorFlow. If it's some 
random Python package that we haven't as a will yet. It will attempt to download this source Python package from uh, PyPy. Uh, if it's pure Python, that is never an issue. We just download the, the, the source code. It will uh, create the wheel and pip install it. So it will uh, it will not install binary wheels from PyPy. So we have a configuration file for pip that basically blocks the installation of binary wheels from PyPy because they're usually not compatible with our stack. Uh, but it will download source wheels. The one exception we have is MPI for Py because that needs to link to a particular MPI version. And for that, we basically block it from pip installing it. So pip install will not find it because it refuses to install both from source or uh, and the binary package. And for that, we say, please use module load MPI for Py. We will have like a custom module for MPI for Py. And there's also some, some cases like Qt. We have the Python, uh, uh, the corresponding Python package installed with the module. So we, when people do module load Qt, they will get PyQt uh, on, on the site as like an extension. So it's not, it's not completely purely wheel. I mean, the vast majority is wheels, but there are some things implemented by module. So when you say that um, if you don't have wheels, you, you try to download the source and then build it yourself, um, it, does this usually work or are there any tweaks that you have to manually make? And how do you ha handle dependencies in that, that case if they are defined, you know, whether in requirements or mm -hmm. uh, stuff like big file and so on? So is that taken care of automatically? Mm -hmm. Uh, so the question uh, yes, is, uh, yes. how do we deal with dependencies? So usually, usually it it just works. Like um, people will just install the the virtual environment. They start a virtual environment. They do pip install my random PyPy package. So as long as they do that, the pip install will just download the random Python package from PyPy and try to create the wheel. Now, if it's pure Python code, it will just work. It will create the wheel, install it, boom. Uh, as long as it's compatible with the particular Python version, fine. If it has a list of dependencies, then of course the dependencies will be resolved. Most of these dependencies will usually be in our wheelhouse. We'll use the wheels from our wheelhouse. This particular version is not in our wheelhouse. It will, of course, then download that version from, uh, from PyPy and try to compile it. And if that uses particular uh, C code for which the module is not loaded, then of course it will fail. So in that case, they we tell users, okay, please write to us with your with your issue, and we'll help you out. How often does that happen? How often does happen that users have? And uh, it's one of the more common support tickets that people have issues with Python packages. So yeah, I, I mean, it's it's like, I mean, we can we can handle the load. And, and like I said, <laughs> given that we have more than 10,000 wheels, it's one of the one of the big workloads of our team is just installing those wheels in the wheelhouse. So 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 Python is an extremely popular ticket topic. It's yeah, there are multiple tickets per maybe even per day it's it's uh, yeah and and but m most of them are straightforward so maybe small add on to dennis this, this question on the dependencies it usually works but you're you're not controlling which versions get installed right pip figures yeah. it out by itself it's going to take the latest yeah. version and if, if you're lucky enough it'll all work but if you do the same installation tomorrow, you'll get different yeah. versions of dependencies, yeah. and that yeah, you're losing that control. Yeah, we're losing that control. Maybe right. users don't care, right? Yeah, if it right. works. Yeah, yeah. and uh, I'm, I'm, I, I had one more, more challenging ticket where the user just, for whatever reason, tried to combine a new PyTorch with an older NumPy, and he just had the requirement of NumPy one nineteen three, 
in his requirements. And I said, why do you do that? And he never answered that question. I said, well, you can't combine old with new that way and expect things to work, but. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know. It's, it, 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 it then spit out an, an, a message of the ABI being incompatible. And he said, yeah, but my, my machine learning still produced outputs. So it seems to work, even though I kept this ABI yeah, but I said, yeah, but you're playing with fire. It's it seems to work, but it may crash at random times or give incorrect numbers, and you just don't know. So. We, we have a, a we have a question via Slack as well. So on collaboration, collaboration between the alliance and Easy, how about running the same reframe tests on both software stacks? Would that make sense? So the Easy test suite we're working on that Casper is probably going yeah. to talk about. Well, that's an excellent idea of uh, looking at your your reframe test. Uh, yeah, the, I'm not sure if they work out of the box, but uh, we should certainly do more re reframe testing. There's another question. We have a basic, um, a, a basic suite already of reframe tests. It's the OSU micro benchmarks and the module loads just to, to make sure that all the combos work. Yeah. Another question in Zoom. Um, how many employees are involved in the software installations? Um, um, I'd say about 15 are on, for, on, a, on a regular basis installing software, uh, or wheels or easy content. 15 or 20 out of the top of my head. So we have like we the have four like RSP RS. people, uh, Maxime Boissonneau, Charles Coulomb, and me, and Doc Roberts. Uh, and then uh, and then there's a bunch of people, more local. Uh, you may have seen them in, in Easy Build on GitHub. There's uh, in the Atlantic Provinces, Oliver Stucker, Olivier Fisset, uh, Ale Tirachi, uh, Atta Rutkar. So, so just out of the top of my head, I have like five names there. So it's, and there's probably about 10 orders. So, yeah. 